Dr. Chomsky. Um, if I understand correctly, uh, you're, you hypothesize a natural language that's a kind of a functionality in the brain, and what we actually speak is uh, kind of a simple epiphenomenon on top of that, and that the actual language is more complex and rich than we actually ever use. Uh, do you have any hypothesis on how all this excess capacity came to be there? Yeah. So, I mean, it just seems to be a fact that our language capacities involve, I mean, some things just seem to be factually correct. Uh, say that there are garden path sentences. There are sentences which are, where our mind, the mechanisms of our mind, assign to them a certain set of properties. But when we perceive the sentence, we don't. Uh, our interpretive capacity doesn't doesn't assign them those properties. We have to go through some other course of inquiry using our scientific capacities and so on to notice that discrepancy. There seem to be things like that, and that just looks well established. So why did it happen? You know. Why did we get this system? That's like asking how we got anything else. Why did we get a circulatory system? Why do we have arms? You know, very, virtually nothing is known about those questions. I mean, you know, there, there's things known at the very, you know, there's something known about why uh, a mixture of simple gases uh, with an electrical spark going through it uh, can ultimately turn into something remotely like, a, not really like, but the beginnings of a bacterium. I mean, at that level, some things are understood. Uh, and they're understood because the physical laws involved are more or less grasped. Uh, there are things understood, of, some things understood about uh, the, the basic forms that exist in, in life, you know, bilateral symmetry, you know, there's some biophysical things that are understood, more or less. But when you ask why uh, uh, particular organs exist, you can't say anything. You can say some weak things. You can say that things won't be around uh, if they're harmful to reproduction, because then they'll die off through natural selection. That you can say. And you can say a few other things. You can say some things about population genetics and so on. But you can't say anything much about these topics. And in fact, uh, you know, I don't think serious evolutionary biologists have any doubts about this. If you want to get a good picture of it from the point of view of one of the best, uh, have a look at Richard Lewontin's uh, article on the evolution of cognition in the third volume of uh, the Encyclopedia of Cognitive Sciences that was published, edited by Daniel Osherson and other people, by, published by MIT Press a year or so ago, where he goes on to give, a, I think, a very plausible argument as to why not only do we know nothing about the evolution of cognition, but it's not even clear that there's a question there that we can ask seriously. I mean, the reason why we have the kinds of systems we do in the brain is probably because that's the way physics works. You know? As he says, pretty reasonably, for all we know, when the brain reaches a certain level of, maybe, you know, the brain may have gotten very big in order to do things like, to take a semi-joke, which he gives to cool the blood. No. I mean, it could have been a thermoregulator. It's not impossible, like Aristotle thought, that the brain was a thermoregulator, uh, cooled the blood. That's why you got so much blood flowing around. When it reached a certain scale and complexity, because of the way physics works, biology works, and so on, it just had certain properties. And one of those properties could have been, uh, you know, sort of ability to solve some kind of problems or a language capacity or something else. Uh, if cognitive capacities are like other things in the biological world, that's probably the right kind of answer. Now, you know, once some of those capacities were around, it's conceivable that they contributed to differential reproduction, in which case you would tend to have, you know, more individuals around uh, with those properties. But as he points out, even that isn't very reasonable. I mean, if you remember that most of human evolution was sort of small hunter-gatherer societies, you know, little groups of people who were sort of foraging around in the... Uh, uh, for food and trying to avoid saber-toothed tigers and things like that. Uh, and as Lewontin points out, and if you want to construct, you can construct all kind of fairy tales and stories about this. Uh, he says, well, how about the following fairy tale? Uh, how about the one that says that uh, you were more likely to live and hence reproduce if you were dumber and less imaginative? Now, this, as he points out, there's some plausibility to that. I mean, if you've got a group of hunter-gatherers and one of them happens to be courageous and, you know, uh, imaginative, and he wants to try to see where that saber-toothed tiger is going and so on, uh, he'll probably get, he's more likely to get killed. Now, his presence in the tribe may help the tribe survive, but his genes aren't going to be transmitted because he's more likely to get killed. The ones who are more likely to survive are the ones who are cleverly sitting at home and waiting for him to kill the tiger and bring in the food. So maybe there's selection for stupidity. 
uh, and for lack of imagination and so on, so that then you get the opposite of the development of cognitive development. As he points out, that's as good a fairy tale as any other. Thank you.